I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at ANSYS with Joao Giada. He's going to talk today about silos versus multi-physics at 7 nanometers, 5 nanometers, and even down to 3 nanometers. Joao, what's changed? Why are we talking about uh, some of the issues of silos versus um, multi-physics now versus what we were doing in the past? What's changed? That's a good question. Largely, as geometries have become a lot smaller, wires a lot thinner, the range of physical effects has increased. Variability has increased. The range of my neighborhood that has an impact on me has increased. And because all of these transistors are so small, um, the nonlinearities became extremely noticeable. And they're all coupled. Does it get worse at each new node? So the problems that you're dealing with at seven nanometers, are they worse at five and again at three, or are you dealing with the same issues? The same physical issues, to be sure, but they're compounded. The, the exact reasons why they became very noticeable at seven keep getting compounded at each generation. It's not something we can safely ignore anymore. So what have you drawn out here? So we've all been used to thinking that timing is non-linearly dependent with process and voltage and temperature. We talk about PVT for a reason. What we've not taken into account is that they all interact strongly with each other. When you think about the traditional timing flow, we deal with each one of these components. Uh, what I've drawn basically is a multi-dimensional diagram. We used to talking about timing versus process, or timing against voltage, or timing against temperature, timing against any one of these variables as isolated silos. Be, and this has been tradition. What we haven't stopped and think is that there's been an inflection. The combinations of these effects are now very large, and they all interact with each other in a very strong manner. So when you have a multidimensional space with very large nonlinear interactions, it is no longer safe or prudent to keep analyzing them one at a time. Are they additive? People have thought about uh, physical effects as one affects the other, and if you do one thing wrong, it causes a problem somewhere else. That's the reason why there's an inflection. Treating them as additive effects, where you could do them one at a time and do, you know, use superposition, was good enough. We all knew it wasn't perfect, but it was good enough for doing the engineering. The size of the effects is now so large that 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 it was going to be linear over a small distance is no longer a legitimate assumption. And that's fundamentally why we've had this inflection. We're also doing other things like lowering the voltage, which in turn tightens the tolerances for each one of these, right? So you've got each one of these, these knobs that you turn has a big effect somewhere else. Exactly. So we've moved from, you know, in any one of these diagrams, we moved from the safe linear part of the curve to the extremely nonlinear exponential side of the world. Um, we've moved voltage as close to threshold, or most, you know, many designs now have sub-threshold operation. This is an exponential regime over here. The same thing in process. We're trying to get as close to the limits of the process as we can. Again, it's a highly nonlinear region. We're having to deal with designs that have to operate longer. And so aging effects, again, nonlinear. And the continuum of temperature we have to deal with is both nonlinear and non-monotonic. It is extremely hard to make assumptions about the behavioral combinations. So what's the way out of here? How, how do you get these designs to actually work and account for all these different things that you're talking about? The question we ask ourselves at ANSYS is why are you optimizing the design for the tools as opposed to the tools for the design? The data is available, the simulation technology is known, why not just throw everything in the tool and build out at scale multi-physics simulation to address the problem? Tell you how the design is actually going to operate. And what's the solution? So the solution is you do, th that's why this one picture, you th throw all the data that you have available into the system at once. and 
there's several methodologies, several approaches to moving forward with that. One side, the, uh, the first step to a sense, is throw all the data in, analyze the results, and figure out where does the traditional approach that you currently use have exposures, have holes. And then decide, are those holes big enough that I'm going to trip over them? Do I need to merge them safely? Can I afford to margin? But you can only answer those questions when you have sufficient simulation data that tells you precisely for your design what are the consequences of ignoring this. Once you know, once you have that data, then it's a risk versus effort trade-off. You can just margin it. You know the consequences of margining is that everybody, your entire design is going to pay the penalty for a few dangerous outliers. At that point, depending on the characteristics of your design, you have to make a trade-off. Is this worthwhile for me for the engineering effort? Or do I need to dial back those margins, make the design under certain cases dangerous, and adapt another step that catches the outliers, and if they're going to cause frequency loss or missing a power target, fix those specifically. Um, again, just enrich your approach. One of the trends that we see happening here is using margin much more selectively. So you really need to understand where you're going to apply that margin instead of using it everywhere. Does this kind of approach allow you to do that? Exactly. One of the dangers of the siloed approach is that every margin is isolated, siloed. You don't even necessarily know where it's coming from or where it's been hidden. And so it is impossible, I was about to say difficult, but I'm going to exactly say it's impossible for you to understand where your design really is. When you combine all of the effects all at once and observe the simulated model, you have a much better understanding of what the design envelope is, what the manufacturing envelope around it is going to be, and so you can make a precise judgment of what you need to be margined in the context of all of the dimensions, not one dimension at a time, and what is safe within your design. And these are very design specific. It's not that you can use these decisions for a high speed part and apply the same decision methodology to a low speed part. So really what you're doing is looking at margin from a system level as opposed to a block level, right? You're really understanding how the parts work together and that system may even be beyond the chip. Of course. So part of this multi, I didn't draw it because it gets really challenging to draw more than three dimensions, uh, is that there's components on stacking and multi dies. There's, you know, the temperature effect isn't just the temperature I cause, but it's the temperature of my upstairs and downstairs neighbor impact on me. Um, it's the combination of effects with dealing with the packaging and electromagnetic coupling between a high speed part or a surdies on top of a logic part or an analog part. It's, you're trying to get a picture of your whole system and make appropriate decisions. Are there any surprises that come along as a result of this? Do you find things that you didn't expect when you're doing the multi-physics analysis and say, hey, we can chop this out, we don't need it? For many of the customers, the answer is yes, but it's viewed currently as institutional private knowledge. Um, people are discovering major opportunities and risks within their existing designs by looking at this approach and there will be a new generation of competitive designs that are making use of this data. Does it get more difficult as we start adding in things like AI? AI seems to be adding, being added into almost everything that we, we can think about these days. The problem with AI is it's very complicated and it, some pieces of this are always on. Does this start taking this into account? AI is challenging and it's very problem specific. And this is one of the, the interesting things about this type of methodology. This methodology, the, the beauty of this is it's targeted to each individual design style. You're looking at the naked physical reality of what that design is doing, as opposed to margin rules, which tend to be anecdotal. You're now basing it on actual simulated information, as close as our models can 
provide. So different design styles will come out with different trade-offs after this kind of analysis, but they will be tuned for that for what that particular design is doing and what it isn't doing, because that gives you opportunities as well. So in the past, we would create a billion unit design and everything was sort of a cookie cutter approach after that. We've changed. It, it's now much more custom design, more one-offs than what we were doing in the, fast, in the past. What happens here with this kind of analysis? How does that change things? Really interesting question. And we're seeing that across the entire ecosystem from our system uh, suppliers that are using silicon as a way of differentiating from each other through automotive and communications. Everybody is using silicon as a differentiator and by definition all their silicon is different. One of the challenges of that is that there is no longer quite the same institutional memory and institutional knowledge about how to do a high-speed CPU. They're all different. Because they're all different you can no longer use the traditional rules of thumbs to make your design safe. Uh, you can no longer b borrow institutional knowledge from each other. You have to tune it to what your design really is targeted to do, what its optimized task is supposed to do. And this is, again, reason why we're hitting this inflection point is the style of the design and the target of the design has changed. That also opens up to all sorts of opportunities for how you do the design too, right, that you couldn't do in the past. You can potentially get maybe a 100x performance of what, over what you could do in the past and potentially significantly lower power. Exactly. There is a reason why people are discovering that the way to differentiate nowadays isn't just through the software stack. It's the software and the hardware optimize for each other for the specific task that your company does that is different than everybody else. AWS is doing something different, you know, Amazon is doing something different than Facebook. They're both designing hardware for a reason. So why now? Why hasn't this been done before? Fundamentally, we're an engineering organization, all of us. We, when it comes down to it, we have, we do as efficiently as possible the work we need to do for the particular target we're going for. We built the original models and the margin approach because it worked. It was the minimum work we needed to invest in technology, tools, and methodologies for the problem we used to have. The problem we used to have isn't the problem we have now. And so at that point, engineering and methodology has to adopt to a new reality and the new target and optimize for that. And this is why the change. And this is sort of the problem we've been running into for years, which is we followed the ITRS roadmap for many years. Now suddenly that roadmap is ended. We have to find our way almost through the woods here because there's, there's no map anymore. But that's also what makes it really exciting. <laughs> this is an opportunity for vendors like us and our broad array of customers and startups to discover new paths and new approaches and new methodologies. This is a wonderful world, in my opinion, right now. Joao Giada, thanks for a great explanation and always a fun conversation. You're most welcome. <laughs>